Welcome to today's program titled, Don't Let the Pendulum Hit You As It Swings, How Employers Can Prepare for the Biden NLRB. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Jennifer Mora. Jennifer, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, um, or afternoon, depending on where you might be calling us from today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Mora. I'm a senior counsel in our firm's San Francisco office. I spend a great deal of my time on traditional labor matters and have been doing so for about 20 years. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Paul Galligan, who is a partner in our New York City office, who also devotes a significant portion of his practice working with employers in all industries, large and small, with their labor management relations needs. Um, we do encourage questions in the chat. Uh, we will try to monitor those and get to them if we can. We have a lot of material to get through today, so, uh, but definitely take advantage of that feature. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So why are we here today? This just sounds probably like another one of your typical labor law updates, right? Um, if only that were true. Um, if you know anything about the National Labor Relations Board, you know, and we've been seeing this word used now for the last six months, that the pendulum swings back and forth depending on who is in the Oval Office. When we have a Republican president, we have an employer-friendly NLRB, and when we have a Democrat in charge, we have a labor-friendly NLRB. So where does Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, sit? Um, he has said, and he's been very, very honest and open about this, I want you to know that I'm a union guy. Unions are going to have increased power. This is not much of a surprise to anybody today. Next slide. He's also talked about um, creating a cabinet level working group that's going to focus solely on promoting union organization and collective bargaining. And what we've seen in the last few months is that he did in fact um, uh, create a cabinet level working group, those now in charge of the National Labor Relations Board that are living up to the promises that he, he has made um, to organize labor during the campaign. And so that's what we're going to talk with you about today. Next slide. So just to give you a quick update as to what's happening at the NLRB, as of right now, the NLRB has three Democrats and two Republicans. And so we've now shifted back to a Democrat majority National Labor Relations Board, and we expect it to be this way, at least dominated by Democrats for as long as Democrats um, are in the Oval Office. Um, we will be mentioning Chairman uh, McFerrin a great deal because as Paul is going to tell you, she has issued some of the most scathing dissents in Trump majority decisions that we have seen in quite some time. And what her dissents, they were actually very helpful to us management side labor attorneys because they gave us a preview as, as to what we expect the law to be once the new NLRB starts weighing in on some of these many issues. Next slide. So General Counsel Jennifer Abruzzo was sworn in on July 22nd, 2021, just a few months ago. She's formally Special Counsel for Strategic Initiatives for the CWA. She has a lot of um, prior experience and time at the National Labor Relations Board. She has been appointed for a four-year term, and she is not wasting any time at all. Next slide, please. During the months of August to September alone, she has issued five very detailed general counsel memos, and what those do is they highlight her agenda and goals during her term. So to give you a preview of what you're going to hear from us today, Paul is gonna talk with you about handbook and policy considerations, which make up a very large bulk of that August 12, 2012 um, memorandum. Um, the issues that created the most heartburn for Chairman McFerrin, as Paul is going to talk to you about, are those policy type um, decisions that she, she viewed were infringing on employee section seven rights. 
I will then turn to talk about the remedies and settlement agreements issues and then some other enforcement issues that we um, that have come about as a result of these memos. We're not going to dig into student athletes. Um, we do, our firm has, I believe, written some things on that. Happy to put you in touch with um, our experts on that. Um, and then once we get through all of that, Paul is going to close us out with some things to consider after you're able to digest everything that we're about ready to throw to you. Next slide. So I'm going to hand it off to Paul, who is going to talk with you about uh, handbooks, which is just a big issue for even employers that don't have unionized workforces. Paul? Yeah, and thank you, uh, Jen. Um, it's interesting looking at the slide in front of you, if you can see it. Uh, it's another quote this time from Jennifer Abruzzo, um, really, you know, making it clear what she, what her agenda is. And, you know, probably if you were, if you were to look at one particular document to, other than, of course, th this presentation, um, to find out what's going to happen, it would be the GC memo 21-04, which is on one of the previous um, slides, which was uh, issued by uh, Jennifer Bruzzo on <clears throat> August 12th. And it's a pretty long uh, memo, um, and it, it, it sets the agenda one through 20, I think, 20 different types of um, changes that she is looking to make uh, by guiding the board in that direction. Um, there's a lot of sub, sub parts to it um, as well. And, and it's almost teed up as uh, in, in terms of order of preference, but we know that's not typically the way it happens. The, the, um, one of the one of the main points in her memo is that is that certain um, certain subject matters have to be referred to the division of advice in Washington D.C. Um, and that is uh, you know that's the think think tank of the of the board and it's something that uh, reports directly to the general counsel so she so she can keep tabs on what cases are coming in from the regions. And what, what that signals is that they're looking for the right case to bring these, uh, to bring this agenda forward. Um, you know, outside rulemaking, the board, um, the board develops its, uh, its, its case law. And so there has to be a case that, that her office is willing to bring forward to change the law. So, so nothing, there's no, there's no pointers out there in terms of when this is going to happen. Um, we, we we only ju just got into the uh, to the Biden majority now um, after after August, um, so you know nothing nothing major has happened yet except maybe the student athletes decision, but it's not. But all all the agenda items for Jennifer are still out there and still waiting for the right case. And next slide, please. Boeing. Boeing is the bet noir uh, for um, from from uh, <coughs> Lauren McFadden uh, McFerrin. Sorry, um, Lauren McFerrin uh, uh, dissented in, in Boeing, as did the uh, the other Democratic appointee Pierce at the time. Um, Boeing. Uh, you, we can almost skip this slide because it's going to be ancient history very very soon. This was the Trump board's effort to change the, the dynamic of handbook review. Um, you, 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 you may remember before, before Boeing, um, the, the, the standard was, was viewed in terms of what, what would a reasonable employee in the workplace think of a rule. Um, and the, uh, the, the Trump majority uh, hated that. Uh, and, and a lot of employers hated it because it didn't set any kind of objective standard at all, and it, it left them vulnerable to questions on on any parts of their handbook. Um, but but the Trump board in, in the Boeing case completely changed, overruled uh, the, the the case that the prior case, which is Lutheran Heritage Village. Uh, they specifically overruled it, and they uh, set in place this three category balancing act. Um, and they and, and then they use that to tee off on a number of different specific 
Tom book uh, provisions that the Trump board believed were lawful, but which, um, you, as you'll see, McFerrin thinks are clearly unlawful. And when you tie in McFerrin's opinions on these various cases, and she dissented in quite a few of them, including the Boeing case, that you you know you tie that with Jennifer Abruzzo's um, agenda spelled out quite conveniently in her GC memo 2104. Then you then you will know what's going to happen, and you don't won't have me and Jennifer tell you what's going to happen. If this is going to happen, we can move on to the next slide, because, like I said, there's no we we, we can't we don't have to tease this out. It's it's going to be uh, overruled as soon as they can find a suitable case. Next slide, please. So handbooks and policies under the Biden board. So. Uh, According to Jennifer Bruzzo's memo, uh, there are a number of targets, uh, so obviously specifically handbooks. Uh, and, and, and the important thing about handbooks is that this is, a t this is targeting uh, non-union um, um, employers specifically. It's not really that big a concern for union employers um, because they've been living with the union, they have a collective bargaining agreement, they may or may not have a handbook besides that. But the handbook typically uh, it, it, it does not uh, supersede the collective bargaining agreement. This is, this is all about organizing, um, and which is by obviously one of Biden's agendas to, to give unions a helping hand um, because, they, you know, because of, the, of the last four years where they just got pounded with these cases. Um, and, and because because Biden is not is probably not going to be able to get his labor agenda through Congress, um, given the way the budget is gone, um, he's going. It's it's going to be up to the NLRB to fix to fix this as far as unions are concerned. This is really the only way that he's going to help that uh, is going to help them. So. The first point of attack and, and number one in, in uh, Jennifer Bruzzo's memo is is Boeing, and Boeing is the tee-off point for any number of different rules. But in this, in this slide, you'll see that, uh, that if you want to know which parts of your handbook are going to be subject to attack under the new board, um, you've got confidentiality is definitely number one. You've got to review your confidentiality provisions. Um, they're going to be attacked pretty quickly, I'd say non-disparagement. Um, and again, this is all based on McFerrin's dissent in various cases that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, social media um, uh, policies, uh, media communication policies, civility rules, that's going to be a big one. Uh, there are a lot of handbooks that talk about loyalty and, and respect and, and civility in the workplace, uh, which, which are usually pretty broad and will be subject to attack um, and remember that you know unions, unions um, you know use uh, use employer handbooks to to file charges to to help organizing campaigns, uh, and the board in any charge that's filed, um, whether it's got anything to do with your handbook or not, um, a charge filed against you will result in you being asked to produce your handbook so they can so they can review it. So it is important to look at what's going to happen with these particular clauses. Um, like I said, civility, respect, professional manner, uh, they, will, they will be closely scrutinized. Offensive language rules, cameras at work, no, uh, recordings, things of that nature, all of those are, are, are very vulnerable uh, clauses in your handbook right now. Um, so as I said, as I said earlier, um, McFerrin uh, has made it clear she wants to return to, to Lutheran Heritage Village. Uh, she makes that quite clear in her dissent, and uh, Abruzzo is, is definitely uh, on, on the same page with her in that regard. So uh, we're going to get Lutheran Village Heritage Village back uh, at the very least. Um, so next slide, please. So as I said a minute ago, the first, the first, the one that's that's uh, number two on on Abruzzo's list of of, of uh, twenty um, offensive subject matters for her is the confidentiality. Um, there are several cases that the Trump board um, uh, 
basically using the framework of Boeing, um, which you know is, is an employer-friendly way of looking at handbook language and their balancing test. They then use Boeing uh, to um, to uphold various um, provisions in handbooks um, regarding confidentiality. Uh, LA Specialty Produce um, is one. That, that's, a, that's a case that really just kind of clarifies uh, the Boeing standard a little bit and, and brings in an object, object, objectivity to the analysis. Not, it's an objectively reasonable employee rather than the reasonable employee. Um, and this was, this was, was a, a huge step. It doesn't sound like much, but it's a huge step from, from subjectively to objectively when you're dealing with how uh, handbook language is, um, is interpreted by the ordinary person in the workplace. Um, so that, that was a, a LA specialty produce. So we expect that's going to be history soon as well. Um, uh, then the, the twin cases of Apogee Retail and, and Alcoa. Uh, Apogee overruled uh, a, a, um, an Obama board decision called Banner. Um, it, it basically is one of those. It's one of those things I, I think where the board really doesn't quite understand the importance of internal investigations, particularly ones involving a hostile work environment, race discrimination, and the like. Um, according, to, uh, according to Apogee Retail, it's, it's perfectly, uh, having overruled Banner, according to the Trump board, you can have broad, broad confidentiality requirements in an investigation um, that employers uh, want. They want to be able to uh, have these investigations confidential for any number of reasons. And so, so we expect Apogee Re Retail will be, uh, once they find a suitable case, will be overruled and will be back to at least the banner standard. And the banner standard is a, it's like a business justification. If you can justify um, the need for confidentiality in a specific investigation, um, but that's very difficult. We've, we found practicing under Banner before Apogee came along that that's a very difficult standard to uphold. You have to basically have evidence that, that the, your investigation is subject to being tarnished, uh, uh, you know, and that there's, there's an interference with your investigation. You have to have specific um, evidence of that before you can use the business justification exception and, and institute confidentiality. That's a tough standard. Uh, but I expect we'll be back there soon. Um, another case uh, from earlier this year, the Alcoa case, uh, is pretty much the same thing in terms of oral confidentiality instructions. This is a case involving a, another investigation, another investigation that um, you know where the the uh, investigator uh, asked asked each person he interviewed to keep the matter confidential, and that was uh, found to be uh, legal under, uh, lawful under Alcoa. So that's, um, uh, that, th those cases are, are, you know, part of the num number two item on, on, on Jennifer Bruzzo's list. Um, next slide, please. So these are additional, additional targets under the sphere of confidentiality, the, the Baylor case, uh, again, has a McFerrin dissent. Uh, actually, no, the, the Baylor case involves um, settlement, settlement agreements, confidentiality and non-disclosure, uh, non-disparagement um, clauses that uh, Baylor said were lawful. Um, but I know that um, McFerrin has had issues with, with that um, because of the broad confidentiality clauses that you get in these settlement agreements and non-disparagement that um, we expect that Baylor will be uh, will be uh, overruled uh, pretty quickly as well uh, uh, because it uh, involves confidentiality, which is a big issue as we as we talked about. International game um, uh, is a, is a, basically a gag order case. It was lawful to prevent a, a, an employee uh, to make public statements detrimental to the business of the employer. Um, so that that's a kind of those cases kind of go together, um, and and will be history, I'd say, pretty pretty quickly. Um, Dish Network, um, this this does have a, a specific McFerrin dissent. She uh, refers to uh, 
this this is a, a provision where if you have an arbitration agreement, and we know we have the Ethics Center, the Supreme Court has, has weighed in on this um, as well. But but in terms of this is a specifically involving confidentiality clauses in arbitration agreements. In other words, you go to you get to go to arbitration, um, but you have to keep everything confidential. And the Trump board found this lawful in Dish, Dish Networks. Um, McFerrin dissented and referred to employees having to suffer in silence at work. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is another, this is from, this is from McFerrin's dissent in Alcoa, um, which, you know, it, again, it, her, her dissents are very well written and very, very much to the point, except there are also, some of them are 20 pages long, but so this is a quote, we'll show you exactly what McFerrin, um, what her position is, and she's made it pretty clear. Uh, next slide, please. So another area of attack um, for the Biden board is gonna be protected concerted activity. Um, that it's the, 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 um, um, the acting general counsel before uh, Abruzzo was appointed uh, Peter Orr um, actually issued an enforcement memo earlier this year, I think it was in February, where he um, he talked about the need to expand the scope of protected concerted activities and to vigorously enforce, um, uh, you know, the standard. So it, the, the, this is one that was identified early on. Um, and, and the, you know, the case law is kind of confusing in, in this sense. We get a lot of questions about what what's protected, what's concerted. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not clear uh, some of the time, uh, and there's been some uh, even division of advice uh, memos since the Biden board took over, which have found um, not to be concerted uh, activity. So it, it's, still, it's still up in the air, but we expect that certain of these decisions, uh, once they get the right case, they will be history as well. Um, the medic, the medic case um, is actually a good one to to read if you're if you're interested. That's about social media rules and how they're applied. And it, it, there were six provisions of uh, of medic's handbook uh, that were under attack, and the Trump board uh, majority found them all to be lawful. And <laughs> McFerrin, in her dissent. Um, said that, oh, by the way, you know, uh, this is a, again, this is a product of, uh, of Boeing. Um, but by the way, I would have found all six to be unlawful. Uh, this included the disparaging, uh, a disparaging provision, uh, inappropriate communications, using the employer name to comment, uh, f f photos without consent. Um, and then the last one was calls concerning compensation. So. If you if you're concerned about your handbook, you want to look at what McFerrin's already said you would overrule. These are these are clauses that are in a lot of uh, employers' handbooks, the ones in, in Medic. So Medic is a good case to look at if you want to see where things are going. Uh, workplace civility. Uh, we talked about this earlier. The Constellum case. Um, the board found a, a civility clause to be lawful. Uh, that is definitely uh, um, going to be a target uh, for the Biden board. Um, BMW is, it just, is again, non-disparagement, one of those non-disparagement um, rules that we see in handbooks and settlement agreements, and, and that's, uh, again, subject to attack as well. And the Win Las Vegas case is uh, just continuing the debate about what does solicitation mean as opposed to union talk in terms of soliciting at work. Um, so expect that to, expect um, a broad interpretation of what solicitation is. The Trump board took a narrow interpretation of solicitation. Uh, we have to be um, presenting somebody with an authorization card to be considered solicitation. I uh, expect that to be broadened to include any talk about uh, about union unionizing as as solicitation. Next slide, please. And yeah, one of our favorites, of course, email. Um, Caesars Entertainment was a, was the Trump case that uh, overruled uh, the Biden, or they sorry, the Obama board's decision in Purple Communications. Um, 
Purple Communications, uh, you know, said that it was, um, <clears throat> well, actually, just Caesars, or let's, let's go with Caesars, because Caesars is what's under attack. So, so Caesars said that, you know, you know, employers can lawfully limit employees' personal use of company email, uh, whereas Purple uh, Communications held that, you know, it, it's, it's fair game for employees to use email. They can't, it can't be restricted in that sense. So that's something that I think is going to come back around uh, to Purple uh, Communications. I would note that the GC in her memo um, wants to look at other cases involving other elect uh, 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 other platforms that are used at work, um, for example, Discord, Slack, GroupMe. So uh, you may find that it's going to again this pendulum swings very very hard to the right. It's going to go very very hard to the left. The further you go to the right, the further it goes to the left. So expect the uh, uh, purple com communications to be back and employees to have the right to use any of these devices and platforms um, at work. Uh, to organize unions or not. Um, so, in terms of third-party access, you've got the two, you got three cases that the um, <clears throat> Trump board um, uh, basically just uh, upheld employer uh, restrictions on third-party access. Um, the <clears throat> the UPMC and Kroger cases involve um, the dis the kind of discriminate, discriminatory end of it, like wh when is an employer discriminating? They're keeping union people, um, uh, union organizers off their property, but they're permitting other um, other people on the property. I think the um, the uh, UPM, UPMC case will involve the um, involve the union uh, business agents who showed up in the. Uh, this is a hospital, so it's a hospital cafeteria, which is open to the public. And so they were entitled to be there because the public was entitled to be there. Um, so we expect that to be uh, to be questioned. But that it would be actually just to avoid confusion. The Trump board found that 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 restricting the union um, in that situation, not allowing them into the cafeteria, was lawful. So that's that's certainly going to be under attack. Um, the Tobin. Center for, for Performing Arts um, that that involves contractors that are on that are on site, and again, it's, uh, we expect that to be um, uh, we expect the the, uh, the 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 Biden board to um, look closely at employer uh, property rights um, and the access it gives to people, and the, and whether it's discriminatory. All that's going to be under strict scrutiny, I think. And it's laid out again in, in Jennifer's memo. That's I think item number four. So expect this to be uh, waiting for the right case. Next slide, please. Yeah. So we, we've touched on some of these before. Um, you know, the the the, the Trump board uh, in, in Boeing in particular. That was a that was a camera case. That uh, was the subject matter of of the big Boeing case. So that was found. Uh, that was found. That rule was found to be lawful, and will certainly not be lawful anymore. Um, so watch, watch for that. Watch for the recording um, uh, provisions in your handbook. Um, you know, the the, the the there's an AT and T mobility case that's listed here that um, the the Trump board said the employer is free to make any. No recording rule it really wants to, um, so we expect that to be um, to be subject to scrutiny as well uh, when the right case comes along. But so these no rec be careful with these no recording policies, um, no camera policies, um, and then, then LA Specialty, which we talked about earlier, is a media contact case. Again, we expect the rules that restrict employees' uh, contact in the media to be under scrutiny as well. Next slide, please. So I think this goes with the next slide. There's two slides that talk about these are questions that you can ask yourself uh, when you're looking at your handbook or having your lawyer look at the, at the handbook. You know, I would particularly um, play, pay close attention to civility type rules and the confidentiality type rules. Um, 
they're they're going to be uh, front and center uh, for any um, for any region of the NLRB looking at your handbook, and and also then of course the case will go to, to advice. And, and let's face it, no no employer wants to be um, wants to be on that hill um, and have that case that uh, that sets the precedent. The lawyers love it, but the clients don't necessarily like it. So again, review you'll have to review your handbook pretty quickly and and see where this is going. But these are questions that might help you. Uh, you know, does your handbook um, restrict employee access to the NLRB? That's, that's most, I've never seen a handbook that did that specifically, but the, but it's implied in certain rules. Um, uh, you know, prohibiting employees from discussing terms and conditions of employment, that's always a big one uh, because it's too broad. They're are, are obviously entitled to discuss wages and benefits and other terms and conditions of employment. Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are more questions about about you should ask yourself when you're looking at your handbook. Um, uh, regulating social media is going to be a tough one because you've also got the protected concerted activity. Uh, expect that to be broadened. Um, so that goes hand in hand with uh, with what your, pol what your what policy looks like, um, because obviously you you can still make you can still have a social media policy, but you've got to be careful about what you're, um, how you're restricting it, uh, given in light of the, the cases that are going to come expanding what concerted activity actually is. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, I think Jen, Jen's going to take this back, but there's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of um, interesting ones that are at the end of Je Jennifer Abruzzo's memo. Um, that I think Jen's going to talk about. Well, obviously, uh, MP transportation, which is the waiver case. I just wanted to say one thing: we're, we have, we're, the, that was a very controversial decision by the Trump board that um, that was um, upset a lot of uh, union practitioners because it took away their um, their waiver. The, 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 there has to be a specific um, waiver. Uh, that was the, the the law for many many years. Um, uh, and it was it, it was like the holy grail. You could, as a, as a practitioner representing employers, it was very very hard, or it, actually impossible, to prove that a union had waived a particular uh, uh, argument or uh, provision. Um, and MP Transportation said that it, it got rid of the clear and unmistakable waiver standard, the holy grail, and replaced it with the contract coverage, which is very helpful for employer attorneys. Um, it's pretty easy to establish a waiver argument. I expect that case is going to be history um, as soon as they can find the right case. The other one that's interesting goes back to goes back oh before I was born, so that's like 70 years ago. The Joyce Silk case. Pay attention to that one. Um, definitely before Jennifer was born, <laughs> but Joyce Silk was a was a case uh, that hasn't been looked at since the 50s, which may allow uh, the general counsel now to to institute card check without rulemaking um, and without a congressional approach because Joyce Silk um, was the case from the 50s that, that actually instituted that as a remedy, um, you know, that, that the employer had to, uh, had to conduct a card check uh, recognition in that case. So I, I would expect that's going to be an interesting one to see if that comes around and they try and get card check through, through the back door of case law. Um, thanks, thanks, guys. Jennifer, you're up. And one thing I wanted to highlight too, with respect to the policies regarding email use is that she specifically mentioned other types of platforms that employees use to communicate as subject to um, challenge. So that would be like Slack and any other employee medium that you have that where they're communicating. So just keep that in mind. Um, in the first memo with, you know, she Paul talked a lot about all the handbook issues, but there were some other issues that Jennifer Bruzo raised as kind of on her radar. Two of those um, are misclassification and our ever-changing rules relating to wine garden rights. Um, misclassification, that's going to relate to an employer's efforts to classify workers as either employees or independent contractors. You might be wondering, well, why does that matter for labor law purposes? Um, essentially, the National Labor Relations Act only protects employees, so if someone is properly classified as an independent contractor, then they have no protections, at least under the NLRA. 
Um, we anticipate based on the on Jennifer's memo that under the Biden board, it's going to be more difficult for an employer to classify somebody as an independent contractor. And that's then going to increase the number of people who are protected by federal labor law. Um, I think the concerning part of the memo is that um, it suggests that the simple act of misclassifying a worker as an independent contractor um, can be an unfair labor practice. In the Bellox case, um, the board said that that would not be a ULP by itself. Um, it seems that maybe what the general counsel and the board might be saying here is that by just the fact of misclassifying somebody as an independent contractor, that could be viewed maybe as an employer's attempt at stripping away someone of their Section 7 rights, even if that wasn't the intent. Um, so that's going to be definitely something to watch. Weingarten relies, relates to the right of a union employee to request union representation. If they're subject to an investigatory interview, they believe might also lead to discipline. Uh, it's not going to shock anybody uh, who has any knowledge of federal labor law that this is now going to go back to the date to the law that allows Weingarten rights for non-union employees. Right now, under current law, it's only for unionized employees. It's going to shift back. This happens every time we have a new um, a new composition of the board. What will be new, however, and what she talks about in the memo is a possible requirement that an employer share its interview questions with the union representative prior to the interview. And that's obviously, again, you know, Paul mentioned that it seems like sometimes um, the GC and others in DC don't really understand the importance of, for example, investigating sexual harassment or anything like that. And so this could possibly create some issues for employers who want to make sure that their employees aren't being coached in advance um, by knowing what questions are going to be asked. So something to think about there. Next slide, please. So Paul mentioned that there's always a strategic reason why something might go to advice, that's the think tank. Um, a lot of times it's because the general counsel might want to develop strategy with respect to a particular issue. And so really the purpose of that first memorandum was to talk about the various issues that should be going to the division of advice. Um, Paul talked about uh, returning to the clear and unmistakable waiver standard, um, currently contract coverage. So I'm not going to um, go through that, but we expect that it's going to go back to the, um, the clear and unmistakable waiver standard, which is essentially going to make it more difficult for employers to make changes to terms and conditions without having to bargain with the union. Uh, inability to pay. So this relates to situations where an employer and a union are bargaining an agreement, whether it's a first contract or a successor agreement. And at some point, the employer claims, I can't, you know, I'm, I can't afford it or I'm unable to pay that or whatever language they might say that then triggers the right of the union to request the employer's financials. And so uh, employers and their lead negotiators are usually very careful about language they use because they typically don't want to open up their books to the union. Uh, the GC, she put in her memo that she wants to lower the standard for a union to make this argument. So essentially a union would claim that an employer has made an inability to pay claim. The employer would say, I didn't say that at all. Uh, the union files a charge, and now at some point, if we get the right, the board gets the right case, I should say, uh, if they lower the standards, then employers are going to have to be a lot more careful about what they say at the table if they want to be, if they want to ensure that they're not having to open up their book. Um, they also want to modify the rules with respect to the ability to uh, make any sort of changes post-contract, or maybe there's no contract in place and there's a wage increase that's contemplated. Um, that's an issue. And then, you know, one ongoing issue that we've been hearing about for a long time is whether an employer has to negotiate um, discretionary discipline while negotiating a first contract. So that's something that uh, we're probably going to see um, changing over the next couple of years. Um, and then there were some issues in the memo with respect to strikes and picketing, which we're not going to get too into, and a bunch of other Section 7 issues, which, as you all know, is essentially the part of the NLRA that gives employees the rights um, that we've been talking about throughout. Next slide. So thank you, Paul, for reminding us all that this case was long before I was born. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because Paul did talk about it, but the memo does talk
talk about it. What's interesting to me is this was really kind of at the that tail end of the memo. It wasn't like front and center. You really had to kind of find it. Um, but this might be their way, the, uh, the NLRB's or Jennifer's way of getting card checks, so or changing card check or making it more um, easy for unions. And so, um, since for decades it's been the case that um, if an employer is presented with a major with cards, it can still demand an election. And what the um, what Jennifer wants to do is go back to a time when. Um, in order to actually not have to voluntarily recognize when faced with cards, uh, there has to be a good faith doubt regarding majority stand status. And if there's no good faith doubt, or if there's any sort of ULPs pending, the employer might face a bargaining order. Um, employers, I think, especially those that are non-union and are particularly concerned about being targeted for an organizing effort are going to really want to make sure that they've developed their strategy for responding if the union shows up and they've got an envelope and they want you to open it or they want you to see it or whatever it is they want to give you. You might even have to just say, I, I have no interest. I don't want to see this at all. Um, but that's something that you'll need to work with your counsel about, but um, really something to be concerned about. Uh, and we'll see what uh, what that's going to hold for us in the future. Next slide. So moving on to some um, other memos that were issued with respect to remedies and uh, language that should be included in settlement agreements and some other enforcement issues. Um, Jennifer released a recent uh, memorandum on both issues. Uh, we're going to talk about those. But essentially, she is giving or she is directing regional directors um, and regions to be seeking essentially the full range of remedies that could possibly be available um, to remedy unfair labor practices. And she gives a lot of examples. And so we're going to talk about this on the next slide, please. So in the case of somebody who's been unlawfully terminated, she is uh, it's stating that regions should be seeking consequential damages from pay and liquidated back pay. Uh, in the case of undocumented workers, she also wants regions to seek any sort of remedies that will uh, deal with the situation where an employer might have been unjustly enri enriched by whatever it is that they were doing. Uh, failure to bargain cases, she has an entire section devoted to that. So essentially, if she finds that the, or a region has found that an employer has engaged in bad faith bargaining, um, examples, and by the way, none of this is, you know, a limited list, like sh essentially anything the region can come up with uh, to remedy this, but what, what we've given is kind of some examples here. So. Um, requiring to submit to a bargaining schedule that would be created by the board, well, not necessarily the board, but the region, uh, submitting status and progress reports, something that we don't have to do right now, reimbursing the other party for collective bargaining expenses, um, reinstating um, what I suppose is the region's viewing as unlawfully withdrawn proposals, and submitting to other broad cease and desist orders. Um, the <clears throat> The, the memo refers to respondent, but the way I read it, and I'm probably most of us read it, it's, it's very, very skewed such that it really is supposed to apply for the most part when it's an, an offending employer. Um, I don't really read it. People can disagree with me, but uh, it seems to be a very one-sided memorandum. Next slide. Uh, especially in the context of um, bargaining, or I'm sorry, organizing drives. Um, sorry, go way back. One more. And sorry, that should not be organizing drivers. Uh, my bad. Uh, organizing drive. So if an employer is engaged in unlawful conduct during the organizing drive, and this is a section that really is deal, uh, geared towards employers because a lot of this wouldn't come up in the context of a union. So essentially giving unions far more access to contact information for employees, not only that, but actually access to employee bulletin boards. And by the way, this is not not a union that represents employees. This is a union that wants to represent your employees. So it's not like they already have bullets and board access. But if a, if the region has found um, that an employer engaged in unlawful organizing, then the region is going to suggest or possibly order that, or the administrative law judge, so to speak, or whoever, um, you have to give the union access to bullets and boards and equal time during an employer's captive audience. 
meeting. So if you know anything or you've been through an organizing campaign, that's usually towards the very end when somebody gets up in front of a group of employees and talks to them about unionization and the reasons we shouldn't have a union. And according to this, the union would be essentially given equal time to those same employees. Um, re requiring employers to reimburse unions for costs incurred as a result of their organizing effort, which would include the costs associated with any rerun. Um, requiring an employer to read the notice of rights, if you all know right now, you just have to post it. Um, and then also possibly having to do a video recording of the reading um, and then distributing that um, by email or mail for the, the actual notice. Uh, requiring notices to be published in newspaper and social media and requiring employers to provide management and supervisor training to um, regarding the National Labor Relations Act. So I think, and Paul, you know, he'll talk more about this towards the end, but employers are really, when they're faced with an organizing campaign, are have to, going to have to be extremely careful in how they do that so they can, have, so they can avoid these various um, what I consider to be very harsh remedies um, to remedy the act. Next slide, please. Uh, she wants to also be a lot more uh, re aggressive which re with respect to seeking ten Section 10J. So that's an injunction um, that where the region will go in and seek an injunction in federal district court to address serious unfair labor practice charges. Um, she wants regions to be more aggressive in seeking that form of relief. Usually that, I mean, it can come about in all kinds of situations. Uh, typically, usually in most position statements that deal with any sort of termination, the region will ask the employer to provide a position with respect to 10J. But this might come up in a situation where uh, the employer is engaged in a union organizing campaign and some people were fired and the union filed a charge. And the region might say, well, we have to go back we have to go into federal court and get an injunction requiring the employer to put these employees back to work, especially if they were known union supporters. Um, and then in a separate settlement agreement, uh, she essentially talks about how um, settlement agreements that regions present to employers to remedy unfair labor practices, whether it's terminating somebody, whether it's bad faith bargaining, or even whether it's, um, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about with respect to handbooks is that it can be a violation of the act to, to simply have a, a, a handbook rule or policy that violates the act, even if you never enforce it. And so oftentimes an employer might settle that and have to post a notice saying we won't do that again for 60 days. Um, but what now Jennifer wants the regions to do is to include in settlement agreements the remedies that I just talked about with respect to terminating people and that safe bargaining and organizing issues. She, get, she also talks about a possible letter of apology. Um, she wants non-admissions clauses to be the exception rather than the rule. I've never settled in a uh, ULP without including some sort of non-admissions clause. We occasionally get a little bit of pushback, but um, it sounds like now she just wants to make it clear that they shouldn't be included in there. Um, they really should be the exception. And what we read this is essentially an employer completely capitulating. Um, to everything. And I don't know if the board knows or cares or Jennifer knows or cares that, you know, this might just result in far more litigation because employers are going to not want to include or just voluntarily, for example, allow a union access to its employees without somebody directing them to do that and then, you know, preserving appeal rights. So we'll see what's going to happen. Um, we don't know. I mean, I haven't I'm actually waiting for a settlement agreement in a, in a case out here in um, Region 19. And so I don't know if we're going to start seeing all this stuff in this settlement agreement that literally deals with one 81 violation and nobody was fired and it was just kind of a slip up. And we'll see, more will be revealed. So I'm going to turn it back over to Paul, who's going to give you some thoughts and suggestions on what you can do now. Paul? Oh, okay. Um, now what? Yeah, I love that. And then what? Um, yeah, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you, you've uh, heeded our concerns here, um, particularly with the, with the way Jennifer's memo goes with um, so many different issues that she's looking at and so many issues that are going to go to advice for the right case to go forward. 
Also keep in mind the, you know, the political uh, situation with Biden is determined, as you see from quotes earlier, to help the unions out. The historically low numbers, percentage of, of employees that are unionized, uh, historically low. Um, and that's the, that's the main focus here. So all of this um, is, 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 all this case law is, is with that in mind, helping unions and employees organize. Um, so that, that's, the, that, that's what you have to look at. Um, consider a vulnerability assessment. I think, you know, at, at this point, given that these changes could come pretty quickly and given what Jennifer just told you about the remedies that can be in place, I think, you know, I would advise any employer, uh, any non-union employer or partially union employer, um, they have to be, they have to be worried about um, about their handbooks and how, um, you know, how, how, how they read with, with the views of these cases that we talked about, but they also have to be concerned about, um, about you know, organizing um, and, you know, not having the time, you know, with the quickie elections, not having time to, to you know, persuade employees uh, the other way, um, but also with the remedies that uh, we talked about, um, are a lot more serious than they used to be. It used to be, what's the big deal? You know, violation of the uh, National Labor Relations Act, post a notice. Um, now we've got, we've, they're looking really closely at, at juicing up these remedies um, in whatever scenario we're in. So, so I think you've got to, you, you really are obligated to get ahead of the game. Um, and, and one way of doing that is vulnerability assessment. Look at every part of your business and see who's vulnerable because, you know, parts of your business can be organized with, and other parts where they don't have support will be left alone for, for now. Um, so you can get partially organized. Um, so you've got to look at that. You, I, think, I think it's important now more than ever to have managers and supervisors trained uh, about what they can do and what they can't do, what they can say, what they can't say, um, you know, particularly with these remedies, um, <clears throat> you know, staring us in the face. Um, you know, in, in an organizing campaign, you've got a supervisor who, who's afraid of his own job because he sees the union there and he, he tries to self-help and, you know, gets into trouble, so especially when everybody's recording everybody now on their cell phones. Um, the, you know, the, 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 that training has to be in place to avoid, uh, to avoid being organized and also to avoid, um, to avoid the, the, the penalties that we talked about. Um, yeah, and yeah, review your handbook. You know, you've you've got you've got Jennifer Abruzzo's guideline of what she's at, what she's looking at, and you've got to look at all those policies. Uh, and, and again, keep in mind that um, in any any unfair labor practice charge, uh, the the region that's investigating the charge, whatever whatever it relates to, is going to want your handbook to look at it and see if they can find something else that has happened to me a couple of times. Um, so that that would be, you know, it's very very difficult to to answer the, the question in the middle of the slide. Would a reasonable employee read the policy as interfering with Section Seven activities? Very difficult question to answer um, from the employer's perspective, um, because you know sometimes I find that they, they used to well at least until the Trump board came along, they kind of made this up as they went along. Um, what a reasonable employee who's not carrying law books around. Um, I, I think the, the way the, the way to, to resolve that is is to when you're looking at your handbook policy to make it clear without using, you know, legalese if you can define define things um, uh, properly that people can understand, and you know use disclaimers. Um, I'm, Disclaimers are, not, you know, not a prophylactic, you know, but your disclaimers will have to be also written in a way that employees can understand. Um, I always thought the, the board didn't give employees enough credit as to what they can understand, but it doesn't really matter what I think. I think that what you what you have to do is look at the look at look at where you you might need disclaimers to cover broad language, so that the disclaimer would say this is not intended to uh, interfere with your rights to organize. I've seen regions have issues in the past with you even using Section 7 rights. They, they say that's not specific enough. Employees not going to understand what that means. 
So then you, you want to use, uh, to avoid the challenge, you want to use terms that, that are everyday terms, the, the right to organize, the right to, um, you know, uh, talk about terms and conditions, whatever it might be. So the disclaimer will have to be, uh, will have to be non, in non-legal terms as well. Um, so, um, yeah, as Jennifer pointed out, you know, the, this, this uh, Joyce Silk uh, uh, thing with the, the card check, um, I, I think that's a real possibility uh, it, that that's going to be revised in some sense. Um, and so you've got to be prepared for, uh, for the uh, recognition request. It used to be you just, you just deny it or you, they didn't even request it as a phone call. Uh, I think unions are going to are going to figure out ways of requesting recognition that are going to put you in a vulnerable position, uh, subject possibly to, to car check if you don't have a good faith doubt. And I don't know what a good faith doubt is, quite honestly. Uh, I would note that the Joyce Silk case did involve ULPs, but it's possible that that it won't it, it will apply even if there are no no ULPs pending. So, well. We have to stay tuned on that one and develop a response. Um, and you know, based on based on what we've talked about for the last uh, 57 minutes, um, you know, revisit your campaign strategies if you have any in terms of how to deal with organizing. Um, that that involves all the things we just discussed as well. Um, Jen, should I give out the code? Please, I'll actually give it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. Go uh, ahead. F, yeah. S S I Park Shaw. S at four four three nine. Sorry, I was so late. <laughs> I got a nudge through my phone. <laughs> Thank you, um, Paul. Uh, and if anybody has questions, uh, we do have a couple minutes. You can always reach out to us anytime. I encourage you to read the memos. If you haven't already, we've put out a couple of client alerts on them as well, so you can check those out. Can't find the CLE form. Was it sent out? I don't think there's a CLE form, but I'll let um, my tech people respond to that question. Please repeat the code SS Cypher Shaw 4439. SS 4439. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, Hopefully we didn't over, overwhelm you too much, but uh, you know, it's never a dull moment in uh, the world of federal labor law. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.